The way this presentation is going to go is I'm going to tell you a little history of Dr. Sketchy's anti-art school. Then I'm going to give you some tricks for how, with no money and no education, and no friends and no degree and no credibility, I took it from uh, being in a dive bar in Brooklyn to being in over 100 cities around the world. But I have a request from you first. If I have to drone on for a solid 55 minutes and listen to only my own voice, I will be sad. So I will encourage you to interrupt me and ask me questions. And um, basically, if you, if you see something that interests you, you'd like to hear more about it, or if you think I'm full of it, um, I just encourage you to stick your hands up and, uh, and add to the conversation. So, yes? No, that was more of a thumbs up. Yes. Oh, okay. There was some solidarity? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Awesome. So, I'm the founder of Dr. Sketchy's Anti-Art School. Dr. Sketchy's is what happens... Oh, fuck. <laughs> Dr. Sketchy's is what happens when you take your lust and you combine it with booze and you combine it with drawing. Dr. Sketchy's! So I got the idea for Dr. Sketchies when I was working my way through college as an artist's model. The classes I posed for, they were very educational. They really taught me how to render a collarbone. But they also were very sterile. They were under terribly unflattering lighting. The models were nameless collections of tendons indicated only by male model, female model. There was no talking between the artists and the model. And basically, they were run with an idea of, of what I think was meant to be professionalism, but for me, it was very dehumanizing. Where it was like, this person is naked here, so to respect them, we won't talk to them. And they're just like, gonna sit here naked being bored for three hours. Um, I know that was meant to be respectful, but for me, as a model, sitting there, staring in space for three hours where people looked at my knees, I, I didn't like it. I felt that there was a whole historical tradition of modeling that was exciting and decadent and that honored models as muses rather than just as bodies. I was inspired by Kiki Montparnasse, a you know, man raised mistress and the lady in that picture over there. I was inspired by Tim's Lautrec and Montmartre. And I mean, I was, I basically just had this kind of and I don't even know if it was a historically accurate idea, but I had an idea about artist modeling where it could be an art form in its own right. It could be like a fucking sexy art form, and there could be accent and like, I don't know, brocade stuff. It, it, was a, it was a fully realized aesthetic. I also thought artist modeling was really, really hard work and was very low paying. And I thought that there was no reason for this. The classes I posed for were constantly um, sort of underattended. Not that any people wanted to come. The people who ran them were always like, guys, it's really important to you to show up and support or else I'm not going to be able to do this. And as a consequence, they weren't able to pay the models a lot. You're getting 15 bucks an hour, which um, when you are torturing yourself in the sort of poses we did is not that much. So I wanted to create a model of a life drawing class that wasn't just fun for my own edification, but that was part of it. But that was fun, so you didn't have to constantly collect guilt trips on people so that they would come to it. And so you have lots of people who would come, and so you can make lots of money, and you can afford to pay your model a good wage. So I created that. And at Dr. Sketchy's class, we gather between, um, between 50 and 100 artists in an uber cool space. Um, we've done it everywhere from underground speakeasies that have been raided to the police, to the Museum of Modern Art, that our favorite homes are just um, sort of red velvet dive bars that New York is filled with. We take a place like this, we gather our artists, we get an incredibly cool model. Um, a lot of you might have seen Caitlin, or some of you, I hope, have seen. Did you, any of you guys see Caitlin last night? So this girl was blue, she was probably, there were skulls, there were many skulls, in fact. So basically, we get a model like Caitlin, who is both gorgeous and has amazing costume skills and who can hold really cool poses and who can bring uh, theatricality and storytelling to, her, to herself. And we get her to pose for these artists. And then to make it sort of 
more reverent and more fun and get people to talk more. We also have drawing contests and we give out prizes. Sometimes we make fools of ourselves on stage. Uh, some of our male MCs have go It's unfortunate, perhaps, maybe. So this started in 2005 at a little dive bar in Brooklyn called The Lucky Cat. I had been talking big about how life drawing sucked for a year, and my friend 85 said to me, she's like, why don't you do something about it as opposed to just flapping your lips? And New York is a space that's incredibly well suited to doing stuff. There are tons of artists, tons of performers, tons of venues, tons of creativity. So I went to my favorite dive bar and I was like, guys, I've got an idea for something that's gonna change the world. And I didn't say that. I was like, guys, I can really, I can really help your slow Saturday afternoon. I can get all my artist friends in their lushes. Uh, let me do a life drawing class. Then I, I begged my, my, my clown for less friend to pose. I begged all my friends to come and I had the first Dr. Sketches ever, December 2005. After that, it was pretty much an immediate success. I did it with no money. Um, I think I had $20 startup cash and we paid for everything else out of ticket sales with uh, the help of a, a loyal crew of ruffians that you see here. And basically with just a whole lot of stamina and persistence and capacity to be really annoying and, um, and hassle people. So what happened? after I started Sketchies for a few times was I was looking for free ways to advertise myself. So I took to spamming the live journal illustrators community with lots and lots of posts about how awesome Sketchies was. And a lot of people came to me and said, wow, that does sound awesome. We live in Salt Lake City and Salt Lake City is so lacking in awesomeness you wouldn't believe it, but we're stuck here. Why, why does everything good happen in New York and nothing good happen here? I thought that was a silly attitude. I thought that was passive, and that you should take a can do spirit to creating awesome in your area. I, I think it's dreadful to think of amazing things as things that only happen very far away. I think you are the people that create amazing things, and it's your responsibility to make that happen. So I got really inspired by two organizations, uh, National Novel Writing Month and the Austin Craft Mafia. These are both kind of like indie, very specific things, the National Novel Writing Month uh, started in San Francisco. It's basically an event where you, in a fit of caffeine-fueled madness, compose an entire novel in a month. But now it's all over the world, and they raise money, and they use it to build uh, libraries in India and Nepal. They're amazing. Austin Craft Mafia is a group of ladies that get together, ladies with like, crafty businesses that get together and you know, uh, mutually self aggrandize and it's also in a bunch of cities. So I was inspired by this, and I was like, well, I would like Dr. Sketches to spread, but I don't want to be like McDonald's, or, you know, that'd be lame. But perhaps there's a model of how other indie ideas can spread. Perhaps there is a sort of DIY empire, I called it. So I wrote a little tutorial on how you started Dr. Sketches. It was uber basic. I told you how you found a model, how you could persuade a venue into letting you use their space, how you could get free alcohol. And Woo! <laughs> we were all for that. And I posted it online. And within a few weeks of that, I had three branches. Since then, it just kept spreading. It spread to Los Angeles and Seattle and Kansas City, where we totally got bus busted by the vice police because they don't understand the pool dance. It can be artistic, apparently. <laughs> We spread to Toronto and to Rome and to Melbourne. This was actually one of my first branches. Um, one of the things I did with Dr. Sketchies that was somewhat unorthodox is the people I chose to run it, um, like me, did not have business backgrounds at all. The girl who started Dr. Sketchies in Melbourne is a hard drinking 23 year old tattoo apprentice who has run one of my best branches. I, I say to hell with credentials. I don't have them. We're in Sydney, Finland, 
Now, the other thing with Dr. Sketchies was we were not really content to do cool little, like, fun of dive bar events. We had to make a spectacle of ourselves. Um, we did everything we possibly could to promote ourselves. So here we are marching in the Deitch Art Parade. Um, yeah, that was me. That was me way back when. <laughs> Woo! We also wrote a book that you can buy here that I will talk a little bit about later. Uh, suffice it to say, writing a book is really, really hard work, especially if you do it in two months on a laptop that stalls all the time. Oh, I'm my acupuncturist. We had big art shows. There's some of my crazy doctor sketches models with Scott Brooks, who's a fancy hands artist that shows in Italy and gets awards and stuff. And soon before you knew it, Dr. Sketchy's had totally taken over the globe. Now, of course it wasn't as simple as that. It was not simply merely a progression of pasties being laid on a map until the entire world was overcome with boozy spangled splendor. There were some very um, there were some very fundamental things that I learned and there was a fundamental strategy I had. My strategy for how to have Dr. Sketches take over the world, even though I, I didn't know it was going to take over the world at first, but what sort of led to it taking over the world was my strategy of doing everything all at once without sleeping. I think that when you have no money and no credentials and no connections and no degree, the only thing that you can do to make your mark on the world is make super efforts. I don't think normal efforts even count. I think that unless you are decimating yourself and staying up all night, hitting up your idols and traveling to Raleigh and uh, traveling to traveling to Raleigh Durham and, and doing a gorilla art shows in Times Square. I think, you know, I, I just think it doesn't count. You know, I think I think you have to decimate yourself and that's what I did. And I decimated myself in every possible way that I could all at once. I also read a lot of business books which artists don't usually, but I suggest um my sort of preliminary strategy for getting your own business off the ground, be it a webcomic or um, a clothing store that sells the little hoods and cat ears on it, whatever. Um, I believe that what you should do is you should go to Barnes & Noble, you should go to the business section, you should not look at the books that are called like How to Be a Corporate Ninja or How to Be a Corporate Assassin or How to Be like a Corporate Masculine Archetype. Just ignore those. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, How to Be a Corporate He Swashbuckler. Don't, don't look at those, but, but look at the other ones. Look at, look at business books. Even, even business books that seem irrelevant to your like small, cool endeavor will teach you how to talk to suits later. You'll learn the word synergy. Yeah. You know, I have a few. Um, one of them, don't laugh at me for the title, Barbara Corcoran wrote a really good book. It's called, If You Don't Have Big Boobs, Put, Put Ribbons in Your Pigtails. And it's um, it's about how she made our real estate business basically without having any money. And it's really good. And it has um, some very honest truths. Um, a lot of people who start big businesses like Barbara Corcoran don't admit that they um, usually have a mentor, that they usually either came from a rich family or they had a mentor that helped them out. In her case, her boyfriend, it's very often the case. Um, but yeah, it's a very good book. It's very practical. If you have a book yourself that you want to promote, the book, uh, Putting Your Passion Into Print, is the best guide to the publishing industry ever. Uh, David Sterry and Ariel Eckhart wrote it. I use it to promote my book. It is, it is brutal and honest and will teach you everything. It has a great section on self-publishing. Um, the guerrilla marketing books, um, they're a little bit repetitive, but they're, I think they have a lot of good advice also. Um, I think of, well, I, a lot of business books have so much to me. I have a thing against Seth Godin, I have to say. Um, Tim Ferriss' books are pretty good. Um, they, they have interesting strategies, even though they are sort of wrapped into like the, dude bro, I'm bungee jumping in Bali type thing. But I think they have some really, they have some really awesome strategies too. Um, but I think that a lot of it's just going to the business section of Barnes Noble and sitting down and seeing what appeals to you and what resonates with you the most and just taking notes. You know, that's 
that's a really fine point. Um, one of the things that I see um, a lot of artists doing, which I think is very foolish, is a lot of artists only will accept advice that's tailored to artists. And I think having that sort of cross-disciplinary view like you do is so important. Especially the music industry was kind of decimated by the digital world uh, before other industries were. So what independent musicians are doing now is at the forefront of what other sort of independent creators will have to do later. So I highly recommend um, looking at amazing independent self-promoting musicians. Uh, Amanda Palmer is a huge idol of mine, and um, I think that her strategy is really awesome. Um, you know, I recommend checking out music blogs, looking at music marketing books, and yeah, thinking about the sort of branding that a band does. That, that's something that we did a lot with Dr. Sketchies. Um, especially when I had my book tour, I realized that most people don't really want to come to book tours because it's really sad. It's like you, you read your heartfelt book and then you just sit there like, please buy it, I'm, I'm so poor, <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, I, it's, it's just, it, it's hard, you know, it's wrenching. So instead I tried to market it like a music tour where I was doing events and I had all these cool models posing and um, it was like it was like a real thing to go to. And because of that, I sold lots more books than most people, than most like non you know non celebrity people do on tour. And I also got a lot more press for my events. Yeah, it's it's way better than than the please buy my book. Even, you know, even though I'm going to make that appeal later. <laughs> please buy my book. Um, so Dr. Sketchies has been going for five years, and each of our sort of, each year had a sort of different phase to it, and it had different sort of demands that it made, and different challenges we had to overcome, and different strategies that we used. Our first year, 2005 to 2006, that was the year, I was 22 years old, I just dropped out of art school. I had been talking big about all my marketing theories, and generally my theory of doing everything all at once, whether or not it makes sense. A, a strategy that many people did not like. Um, and so I basically tried to do everything all at once. I made really cool posters and I hung them up everywhere. I wrote to every single, um, basically I would go to Barnes and Noble and like write down every single magazine that seemed vaguely applicable to what I did and then write them letters pitching Dr. Sketches. I would, um, and this is a good thing if you have events, Basically, you know when you go to the coffee shop and there are all these like sort of raggedy little pamphlets that like list events in your city? You should be in those raggedy pamphlets. So just write to your event listings, write, do it religiously, eventually you get written up. Um, when I started, I thought that if I got into Time Out New York magazine, I'd be the coolest thing ever. Um, small goal. And now I have a great relationship with Time Out New York and they bring me lots and lots of business. So, you know, try, try to do event stuff. Um, find things that are, how do I put this? Find people that are doing stuff that's like some kind of similar to yours, but who are a little bit above you on the career ladder. Like, you don't want people who are, you don't, you don't, you don't want to imitate Madonna, because it's like, it's not gonna work. You know, she's, she's things that you don't. But you want to find someone who's a little bit better than you and just kind of, kind of watch them, you know? Um, even if they're not your real life mentor, they can be a little bit of your kind of, you know, virtual mentor by seeing how, the, how their career works. Um, see the places that cover them, and maybe those places would want to cover you also. Um, get really, get friendly with the press in your area. I mean, press, are, they're just people like, you know, like you and I are. They also have to turn out content every day. They want to write about you, they're on your side. Um, even, you know, even pretty big presses. So. My, my, big, my big piece of advice then and now is to treat, uh, treat, me, treat journalists like human beings and pitch them story ideas, write to them, uh, send them cool stuff that works a lot. And um, they, will, they will eventually reward you with articles and the more articles you get, um, the more it legitimizes you and the more, the more serious you seem. Um, find out where other similar events are listed list your places there. So, I did this, and by the beginning of 2006, I had a thriving event that had lots and lots of people coming to it. Or at least, at least, the very least, it filled up. <laughs> it filled up the dive bar that I was doing the event in, and I was starting to expand. 
By the middle of 2006, I had 10 Dr. Sketchy's branches, and by the end of 2006, I had a book deal for this book over here. I got this deal because a, how do I put this? A gentleman who was working in, um, I think at Random House, he had a bunch of years at the publishing industry, and he wanted to start his own press. And he wanted a book that was tied in with an event, so it had a natural place to sort of sell it. Now, when I got this deal, I thought it was me. I was like, golly, Jesus, I've got a book, and everything in the world is going to be fixed. Everyone wants to pay attention to someone with a book, you know? Uh, I worked really hard on it, turned it in, and... Three months before publication, you know, I had thought my publisher was going to take care of everything. Three months before publication, I sat down with him and I was like, publisher, tell me about your marketing plan. And he said, it's very innovative. It's like, it's good, I'm, I, I'm, I'm interested. Tell me about the innovations of it. It's like, well, it's, it's very digital. I'm like, ah, how interesting, tell, tell me more. Well, my friend is banned and I'm thinking of we had a card table at a show. Do you have anything else, publisher? Nope. So I knew I'd have to promote my book myself. Um, I think this is an experience a lot of authors have, whether you're working with a tiny independent publisher like I was, or whether you get a book deal from Random House, you realize that you are not their top money maker, Mrs. Sarah Palin, and you will not get a promotion of dollars. So, I had to promote my own book. There are a few things that I did. I, I viewed my, um, my, my book promotion. Oh, is, that, is that a hand raise or a? No. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, viewed my, I, viewed my, um, I viewed my promotion as sort of like a segmented thing. The first, um, the first people that I could reach out to to promote my book were my fans, which I was already developing quite a fan base because I had sketches. And I just decided to be honest with them. I, I, wrote, I put out a call on every single um, social media platform I had, particularly my MySpace, because MySpace was still big then, that was like, hey guys, I got my first book. I don't, I don't know anyone, I don't have any money. I, it's not gonna be an big stores. Can you help me somehow blog about it? Live journal it, please? And a lot of people post this banner, and people were really, into it. And that's when I realized that if you invite people into your world, not as consumers at a trial, but as co-conspirators who are creating something great, people will enthusiastically glom onto that. People helped me a lot. They posted my banners, they would buy like 10 books and give it to all their friends. When I was honest and straight with people and when I passionately believed in my product, people wanted to be part of that. The other thing that made me realize is I had all sorts of people watching me who I had no idea about. And some of them were bigger than I thought. One of the reasons this little book here uh, got onto Barnes, into Barnes & Noble, um, my doctor's sketches book, not my other one. One of the reasons it got into Barnes & Noble was because a vice president at Barnes & Noble was stocking my, my, my space uh, lingerie box. And um, one never knows, when, one never knows who is watching. And he was really awesome to me, and he got it on there, and uh, really helped my sales a lot. So that was my, my sort of my first segment. My appeal to my fans, have them champion me. My second segment, though, and I realized this was especially important for what I did, because I had a little indie book, and when you have an indie or self-published book, everyone thinks it's bad, because they, they think it's like easier to get those books, you know. And in truth, a lot of Indian self-published stuff is bad, you know, it's, so, you know, you have to work extra hard when you're doing that. I realized that what I would need was I would need print press and print press in prestigious avenues. So I was able to get these mailing lists that were meant for publicists that have all the notes. I'm not going to tell you how I got them, but that were that, that have all the um, it is the contact info of like all the of all people that write about books and with notes about them too, like. Um, don't send sensitive authors on Opie and Anthony, they'll make them cry. <laughs> they, they, they really have that. They're like, don't send female authors on this show unless they're thick skinned. So I got these things. I basically wrote to every single journalist I could possibly get my hands on. And then to fill it out, because you know, I wasn't just appealing to book journalists, I was appealing to event journalists and kind of lifestyle people. 
I would look at places that I was going on tour. I would find like the cool people, like say Richmond to Virginia, and I would look at where they were written about, and then I'd write to those people who had written about, like I would look at the rich one or less troop in Richmond, Virginia, I would see where they were profiled, and I would write flattering letters to the journalist who profiled them. Did you have to buy a lot of print magazines and kind of like, it's kind of like you were going down a trail yeah. to find where, you know, regionally things were happening, or did you have to actually just pick up a lot of magazines and maybe... You know, I just looked at their websites, I mean, especially with like alternative weeklies and stuff, which is where I got a lot of my press, um, I just, everything was online, and a lot of times they conveniently have people's um, email addresses too. But uh, this is a little trick. You can usually uh, guess how people format corporate email addresses at their company by looking at how the advertising email is formatted. So if the, because they will always publish the email for you know doing advertising. So um, yeah, I just wrote to lots and lots of people and eventually I got really stellar press. I got on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle entertainment section. I got in the LA Times, I got, when I was in Virginia, I was like on the cover, when I was in Richmond, I was like on the cover of Style Weekly with this giant globe of my art. I got an NPR, which was pretty cool. Um, even though NPR in Virginia was really weird, they asked me if my parents were ashamed of me. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> um, so, you know, I just, um, basically, yeah, you're exactly right. I just went down the list and but the important thing when you're going down the list is don't treat people like list don't treat people like list holding fields. You want to um, get familiar with people's work and appeal to them on the basis of that work. You don't want to write to the person who writes about cats and be like, write about my burlesque life drawing class. It's just it's silly and it's insulting and it wastes their time. Instead, you want to find someone who's a fanboy of burlesque and you want to be like, I really enjoyed your profile of Dirty Martini. I've worked with her before and. I think that you might be interested in my thing of jobs of your interests. You always want to appeal to people as individuals. So those those were the first two levels of kind of um, evangelists I got. Then the third level, the third thing I did was I involved cool people directly in my work. Um, with my Dr. Sketchy's book, I sort of took um I wish I should have had this in the blow up. I took various people who were models at Sketchies, like here's the, uh, the white boom boom, and I made them into paper dolls, or I had their photos in it, or I um, made them into coloring pages. Basically, I, um, I sort of used my work to, uh, to glorify them. And because when I choose Dr. Sketchies models, I choose people who are kind of cool and influential and have their own followings, people wanted to kind of bomb onto the book to get a piece of, of my models. Another thing that I did to kind of tap into this was um, I made these really cool personalized banners for everyone that were, that said, that said, see more of me in Dr. Sketchies, and that kind of had like flashing bits of their illustration that made it look like they were going to be naked in the book, and I gave, it, I gave it to people, and they put it on all their websites, and a lot of people bought it because of that. So, the next thing that I did to, um, so, but then the final thing that I did, and you'll have to do this if you do a book too, is I could just kill my fans and press, I did kill the complete strangers, and that is terrifying. It is absolutely frightening to look up at someone who is blankly indifferent and unknowledgeable about your work and It is absolutely terrifying to look into the face of blank, of blank, hostile indifference and be like, please give me money. It's really scary, and, but when you create a book or do a creative pro pro thing, you do have to do that. You do have to look into the terrifying gray wall of indifference in the world and chip away at it. You should do this book being charming and by not being pesky and by not being creepy and weird, but you need to do it. One of the things I remember, my kind of like gray, chipping into the gray wall of indifference, was um, I had to, uh, I just had to go to Boston uh, for a signing. So I take, I take all my books, uh, you know, I have my backpack of yay filled with books, 
I'm on the Chinatown bus. It's very glamorous. I go to Boston. I look at where all the independent comic stores are. I go there, and you know, I'm working on distribution. I go there, and I basically try to hustle my books to the counter boys. <laughs> um, which is how I got into the Linear Picnic and a bunch of other places like that. I basically, I basically like, was like, hey, this book is really cool. It's in the LA Times. Want to stack? Want to stock it? I'll sign it. And I went from store to store, and a lot of people looked at me like I had typhoid, but some people stocked my book. Then I, I did my signing that I had um, done a lot of pre-press for, and a lot of people were there. I, I maybe like 80 people. I did it, it was tied into the Dr. Sketchy session at Great Scott at all, in Austin. Then I, <laughs> I, uh, I was dancing burlesque at the time. I, um, I danced burlesque at this kind of really divey goth club. And sitting in my burlesque costume, I had a little card table with my books on it, and I basically went up to drugs in the club, and I was like, hey, do you want to buy my book? It's really cool. <laughs> That is the sort of shameless um, humiliation proofness that will lead you on to greatness. <laughs> and then I danced for less, and then I went home and tried to talk the same day because I didn't want to pay for a hotel room. By the end of 2007, oh, oh, I did something else too. I also did the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is like evil boot camp for artists. It is, it will whip you. Basically, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival is when every single um, sort of artsy group in the entire world converges on a tiny medieval city and tries to hustle their shows. There's not enough space for all the artists there. People sleep like 10 to a room. Um, there's a million shows going on. People rent out taxi cabs as venues. Um, we did a Dr. Sketchy session there where we did 21 sessions in one month. And um, me and my Scottish brands kept up the murderous schedule of um, waking up at 6 a.m., flyering. Um, most people have uh, flyer teams, but we didn't because we're poor. Um, basically, what, eventually what we started doing was putting up all our flyers over the omnipresent lady boys of Bangkok flyers that had blanketed the city. I still remember the lady boys of Bangkok, damn you. And, um, we basically, we would get up a flyer, then we'd put on funny costumes and go to the Royal Mile and try to pass out more flyers. Then we would do our event, then we would perform in spots and other people's shows to get people to our event, and then we would drink to 3 a.m. And we kind of repeated this for 21 days. Woo! It was, it was, it was interesting. Uh, in, in Scotland, their, their cuisine is not meant for the health conscious. Their breakfast is called a fry up. So by the end of my kind of super efforts of 2006, in between hustling my book and the Edinburgh Fringe show and getting all this press, I had maybe 30 branches, I want to say. The thing was, Dr. Sketches was reaching a critical mass. We would get press, and the press would bring more branches. This would be a typical example of how things might spread. One of my fans might see Dr. from Toronto might see Dr. Sketchy if they'd asked to start a class. While on vacation, an Australian events producer would see their class, and she would bring it to she would bring it to Sydney. She would hire a German who was on there on a work visa, who would bring it back to Hamburg. He would get a TV a TV thing on him on this German French channel that would then come and interview me, and I would look into the camera and say, "People of Paris, we need a sketches," and we get sketches in Paris, which would get us out to NPR, which would spread a bunch of. Like, and other places. It became this constant cycle of getting press, getting press, getting branches, getting press, getting branches, and we build and build and build until eventually Dr. Sketches became household name. By the end of 2007, we were doing pretty good. In 2007, 2008, that was when we started getting kind of rock star. In 2008, I toured Europe with Dr. Sketchies. I had enough branches to be able to do that. Which ended in performing burlesque and posing at the Finnish Museum of Contemporary Art, which was the sort of white walled, pristine, you know, modern art palace that would not even spit at me in New York at the time. And being in a luxurious apartment suite so paid for by the Finnish government, because in Northern Europe they support the arts. Um, in 2008, 
we started getting so much press. Our branches, that's when our branches started hitting like the 80 to 90 mark, which, and that was when it started becoming fiercely competitive to get a Dr. Sketchy's branch. People would fight over it. There were like defamation campaigns over who could get a Sketchy's branch in your city. Uh, Melissa deals with that now, actually. <laughs> People slander each other for to be allowed to do the life drawing in their town. <laughs> We, um, and we had reached that threshold, and suddenly I wasn't having to go to dive bars anymore and go up to drunk people and be like, would you please buy my book? And suddenly people were coming to me. Suddenly I was speaking at universities. I was getting paid. By 2009, corporations started to take notice. Um, we would get paid like thousands of bucks to do stuff with Dos Equis. Um, the Museum of Modern Art came calling and had me speak there. We got into, you know, eventually we got into the New York Times. We got, like, big profiles. Eventually something that had started out as a crazy idea that no one took seriously and no one imagined would go anywhere, run by a gang of irresponsible lunatics, became a legitimate business, and it was profoundly strange. As of 2010, Dr. Sketchy's is established, I dare say, and there's something terrifying about that. There's something terrifying about realizing that you're still kind of, how do I put this, kind of an angry punk kid who is suddenly at the head, the head of a responsible organization that works with big brands and people expect stuff of you and, and realizing that suddenly you have accountants and lawyers and um, responsibility, but I, I, still, I still welcome that. This year has been one of the, the craziest years for us. We got um, a full page, or I guess it was at the end of last year, we got a gigantic profile in the New York Times um, where the reporter took the somewhat unfortunate quote that I said, which was, um, life, what life gives you doesn't depend on how much you develop your talent, but on how much you develop your name. And she blew it up really big, and everyone got so angry at me. <laughs> uh, it's true, though. I don't, I don't take it back. <laughs> um, we started getting, we basically started getting major, major press and having people take notice. This year has been the first year where it hasn't been about expanding our company. It's been about refining it and bringing it to a diamond point. Because one of the problems when you get big fast is you suddenly find yourself this sprawling octopus under your feet and you don't even know where all the tentacles go. So this year has been about making our Dr. Sketches branches awesome. We developed, finally, a, um, a website that encompasses all of them. And that was my first time where I had to like raise major money and supervise things and basically be in charge of a, a large project that was something that I couldn't kind of hack my way through with, um, with free beer and promises of naked girls. It was the first time that we had to send people cease and desist this year. I was like the man. I had to, you know, I had lawyers and stuff. My, my lawyer represents the Carlisle group. <laughs> it's rather strange. Um, it was the first year where we had to be bad guys and fire people. It was the first year yeah, where we were the adults and it was somewhat, it was somewhat shocking to us. Um, as Dr. Sketchies goes on into 2011, I'm interested as to how it will grow. We're getting more and more branches. Um, we have branches popping up in Moscow and Guadalajara. We get, we've gotten applications from every single continent except Antarctica, and by golly, we're going to make those scientists do it, whether they like it or fucking not. If any of you know people, you know, at, the, at that base over there? We're doing, we're doing some of the most interesting, um, sort of charitable things we've ever done. Uh, Dr. Sketchies in Auckland, New Zealand, is doing the first Dr. Sketchies ever at a prison, which seeing how uncivilized America is to its prisoners is kind of kind of awes me. And basically we have we're spending the rest of, we're spending 2011 refining refining ourselves into a sort of glittering knife sharp point of artistic awesome. So we hope, so we hope. And I'm interested to see how it goes.
Are there any questions, guys? Thank <laughs> you. 